Uh, let, let's get started. I'm uh, just a quick note that I'm going to be recording the talk, so so everyone everyone knows. Um, so the the sort of standard introduction um, uh, at this you know so so this this uh, lecture series um, uh, being put on by the Internet Studies Center um, is bringing together sort of uh, you know leading scholars and practitioners. Uh, whose work sort of challenges and extends our understanding of digital technology, and and this is um, th this is going to be an exciting, fun talk. Um, Jing is an interdisciplinary artist and organizer working at the intersection of technology, labor, and identity. Um, uh, Jing co-founded Void Lab, an LA-based intersectional feminist collective dedicated to women, trans, and queer folks. They serve on the advisory board of the Processing Foundation. For those of you that are not familiar with processing, it's uh, a really important open source kind of creative community and initiative sort of focused on uh, getting, um, you know, it, it getting, techno uh, getting um, designers and artists involved in um, creative coding. Um, Jing holds a master's of fine arts uh, from UCLA Design Media Arts. Uh, and is an assistant professor of interaction and media design at Parsons School of Design. And um, the co-presenter today, uh, Charlotte uh, Yaking, is a software developer for TogetherNet, the project they'll be speaking about, and an engineer living in New York City. Um, and uh, they care about community and how technology can facilitate a more equitable world. So thank you both for coming today and presenting. So you should be able to share your screen if you want. Yeah, you're very welcome and really excited to be here with everybody. Um, just give me a moment while I set this up. Um, are you all able to see the full screen? Yeah, that looks great. Okay, awesome. So we're going to start with introduction. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, this is um, a project that me and Ya Ching, along with a couple um, other of our friends, have worked on. Um, so it's called TogetherNet, and we're really excited to talk to you all about it. So. My role on the project um, is a lead artist, and my name is Xing Xing, and I go by data and pronouns. Hey, I'm, I'm uh, Ya Ching, or Charlotte, um, and I was the lead developer on this project, um, and I go by she, her pronouns. Um, those who can't be with us today are here in spirit. Um, so we have our lead writer, uh, Nima Gidere, and also our advisor on the project, uh, Lauren Lee McCarthy, who actually um, is was the creator and one of the main contributors for P5.js, which is like the, the Java uh, script library and version of processing, um, what was just shared to you. So yeah, we, we work um, on a pretty small, nimble team. And so it was also an art and, and engineering collaboration. And we're going to walk through the software and talk to you about how the collaboration happened. So um, first, we're going to start just by sharing like a two minute video, which will kind of give you a, a very brief introduction of what the software does. TogetherNet is a collaborative archiving software designed to support consentful communications on the web. Hi, this is Xing. I am the lead artist on the project. It's so nice to be here with everyone today. Hi, I'm Ya Xing. I'm one of the developers that built TogetherNet. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, this is Nama. I was the lead writer for TogetherNet, and it's beautiful to be here with you all today. 
Hi, my name is Lauren, and I'm an advisor on the TogetherNet project. It's so nice to be here with you. TogetherNet is created for micro communities in mind, in particular those who work under the broad umbrella of art, design, culture, and technology. Under the logic of surveillance capitalism, platforms are expected to scale. And communicating with hundreds to thousands of people on an everyday basis have become the new normal. However, as illuminated by Enshamina, as our platforms become larger and our bodies become connected with more people, we have yet to figure out how to scale up consent. Together, Ned imagines a future. Where dialogues and community move, a la Adrian Marie Brown, at the speed of trust, where consent is made possible through consensual communications within a micro community. The software is designed for twelve or less people to converse, negotiate, and collectively decide what to archive to the World Wide Web. You may be a group of art students working on a community agreement, and instead of defaulting to Google Docs, you might use TogetherNet to document your collective needs. You may be a group of community organizers, and instead of defaulting to Instagram, you might use TogetherNet instead to save a list of teach-in content to generate an HTML page to be uploaded to your website. You may be a book club, and instead of defaulting to Facebook groups. You might use TogetherNet to create a list of books to read. What would the future look like if we communicate through a consentful process and create archives that are for us, by us, maintained by us, before sharing it out to the world? Together. Um, so that was a very basic, very very basic intro to、um, the kind of goals and ethos we had、um, behind the software and a kind of brief introduction of what it does.、Um, so to give a little more zoom in view on the different components of the software,、um, at the at the broad stroke, there's two different modes of、um, communication. So by default,、um, all the conversation happens inside what we call the ephemeral channel.、Um, the ephemeral channel、um, is built on top of the WebRTC protocol,、um, which is a peer-to-peer -peer protocol that sends your messages between browser to browser and and through an encrypted channel that is built in inside、um, modern browsers, and so. Um, a lot of thoughts were put in on how do we make like this technical information transparent and accessible to a general user, because I think one of the big focus,、uh, among many focuses of the project, is is not again reproduce that dynamic of software engineering,、uh, software engineers or people who build the software necessarily knowing a lot more. Or a lot better than、uh, like a general consumer. So how can we bridge that communication and make a lot of these languages that are like really sort of like very、um, can be very intimidating、um, for people who are just using the software to talk to their friends? And how do we make that bring that to their level? So so the the way one of one of the experiment and what we tried what we ended up with was creating something called a privacy scenario. So. We basically assess the different set of risks and and threat that、um, a WebRTC protocol has. So, and and try to find real life scenarios、um, that people are already familiar with in their day to day social life, and try to map on, try to like match, like、uh, mix and match, like a, a security scenario that's closest to WebRTC. So what what we end up with in this case is sitting at a park. You and a friend are sitting in your usual corner of the park on a picnic blanket, speaking among each other.、Um, so the idea is that when you're speaking on a picnic blanket at the park with a friend, by default, your conversations are mostly private, right? Unless someone 
try to intentionally try to sit behind you with a recorder and try to record your conversation, um, you can kind you can expect like a, a baseline level of privacy. So so I think you know some something some things that we think about a lot is like how do you grapple with the fact that network are leaky, right? Network is always inherently leaky and there's always going to be some form of vulnerabilities, but how do we address that um, without sort of like being deceptive or pretending that it's a perfect system? Um, so, <clears throat> so yeah, um, so there's like also this like idea of like uh, the consentful process where, where we really craft the language and also like inserting like these different buffer to make sure that people really understand what they're participating in before going deeper. So um, this is how the ephemeral channel looks like. Um, you kind of already had a preview in the video. Um, so you are a avatar, <laughs> uh, appear as a box and you can rename yourself and you know give each other a custom color and you can move around. And when you type a message into the room, you leave um, something called a text, a message record um, on the screen. So, so once you have a message record, um, you can you cannot overwrite on top of that space anymore. You have to move to another empty space to leave another message record. Um, and and we have like different ways for these like message records to interact with each other. For example, if you if someone else leave another message on either one of the four side of an existing message. You create a thread, um, and the most kind of like important feature for the software um, is the idea that all the all the chats that are happening on the ephemeral channel stays off the server, right? It always happens. The messages are just stored between you and my and their browsers. <laughs> like, like it's stored between like local browsers and it's being communicated and back and forth between local browsers. And so, which means uh, once the last person in this room closes their browser, closes their tab, um, messages are gone. It's not being stored anywhere. And that's kind of the point, right? That we're trying to meet that we don't, we don't want random casual messages to be stored on server all the time and that there's no way to um, be off of that. So, so, um, so basically in order to, but at the same time, it's like if you're a community, if you're working together, if you're a team, there are times where you want to archive your message. There are times where you want to like put your message onto a server. So, so what we did here was um, one of our core feature called uh, the consent to archive feature, um, which basically is a collective, it's a tool for collective decision where different parties involved, different parties like present in the room have to like collectively, unanimously agree to consent to archive a piece of content. So, so when you choose a message and like decide to like, you know, activate consent to archive, um, and once everybody agrees, like the message would sort of like get turned into this mosaic tile pattern that uh, include, you know, all the all the parties like user color to show that those are the people who have agreed to archive this message. Once you go through like that consent archive process, um, you can then go into the archival mode. Here again, we use a metaphor of posting on a bulletin board um, as as like a kind of like analogy for what it means to. Um, post content onto a database. So the archival channel, this is the second channel, um, it is connected to um, a database. We're using Postgres for that. And, and essentially whatever message in the ephemeral channel that has been agreed upon to be archived gets pushed into the archival channel and it documents which room this conversation took place so, so this, this, you can also create a new room. So these rooms are very, can very much uh, be used kind of like Slack where you can like set different topics and, and these topics can kind of like frame um, the content that gets like nested underneath it. Um, so it also like documents the, the author who wrote it as well as who had like participate in consenting this message. So, so, so once it gets into the archive stage, um, you can actually download 
this um, this archive content into like HTML page. So for people who might, you know, for usages such as, you know, if I'm running a book club with a bunch of people and we just want to come up with a list of books to read and we want to like be able to post, you know, upload this page of this, like all the books that we have uh, come up with onto our, I don't know, the, the website for our club or something. Um, this is where you can like download it and kind of like streamline that process. It's not just streamlining, it's also like kind of encouraging that process. So, so for us, it's like a lot of thinking about how to like install these like subtle cues to like encourage or frame how, how the software is um, used and understood. So some of um, the background information, like one of the first questions that came up um, when the project began was like thinking about how do you, how do you practice consent um, in a digital communication software context? Um, what would it mean to like, assist the user to make explicit decision to what happens to their data without overwhelming them, like without like having them to like click yes or no, or like read like enormous amount of terms of agreement and like having to go through the kind of um, exhaustive task that like corporations usually, you know, tend to make us do not to protect us, but to protect them, right? It's a lot of it's about liability relating to their company and written in legal languages that are not accessible for the users. So um, what really inspired me, there's gonna be, I have like a full kind of further reading list at the end, but what really inspired me um, in the beginning um, was to, like finding this zine called uh, Building Consent for Tech Zine by Una Lee and Dan Tolliver, um, listed under an open source license. Um, this was really inspiring because they were able to like really boldly like map on some of the ideas or practice or knowledge relating to consent that we already know, we already have like sort of like foundations of in IRL and like find, finding a way to like map these notion onto our digital body the body that you know is consists of our personal data that's spread across the internet in different ways. So these are the different principles that they have adopted actually from a guideline from Planned Parenthood. So the first one is freely given. Um, the second one is reversible. The third one is informed. The fourth one is enthusiastic. And the fifth one is specific. So what does that mean? Um, freely given means that as, you know, as a user interface um, designer or as a UI writer, making sure that there's no coercion or manipulation. I mean, in a way we're like very used to coercion and manipulation um, in, a, in a kind of corporate uh, user interface context where, you know, like there's something called a dark pattern. You can check out darkpattern.org that kind of like document like all the different kinds of like coercion, like making sure like, tricking someone to click somewhere they're not supposed to click um, and it triggers ads or maybe it like take you to a pay page that you didn't really, you know, that, that wasn't really part of your intention. So freely given is like making sure that we get rid of all that, um, no coercion and manipulation. And not only that, like to be as transparent as possible and communicate very directly on what it is that um, we are offering the user. And also reversible is the idea of being able to change your mind anytime. So just because you you like said yes to a terms of agreement doesn't mean that you can't reverse that decision. I mean, there are certain things that's irreversible, right? There are certain things once you have once you have like you know given your information to the server and have like submitted your information in a certain way. Like if we're to like really be very nitpicky and like kind of like really think about it through like the surveillance capitalism con um, framework, there are things that um, might be irretrievable. But we're I think I think our approach is very holistic. It's it's more that like trying our best based on like the existing technology and think about what can be done in terms of like practicing reversibility. Um, there's also the idea of um, informed, like making sure that the users are well, well understood 
the, the benefits and risk relating to everything that they interact with in the software. And it's, it's a very fine balance between like informing them, you know, everything that we know versus not overwhelming them, right? So, so it's like really trying to like balance and like think about like what are the parts that are very important for them to know what are the parts that are less important that and that it doesn't like it doesn't create additional risk or threat to like you know kind of be emphasized and and also how do you rewrite some of these like technical info in like very accessible language so so those are like the three parts enthusiastic um option to not participate in different parts of the software um, so I think one of the things that um, you know Yaching and I we talked about since the beginning was like how do we how do we make this how do, how do we build this software in a modular way you know what are ways for in the future for the possibilities of being able to you know pursue like one path or one route of participating in the software but not having to sort of get your hands tied up in that you know what are ways to kind of like be flexible and and I think part of that and yeah I actually can definitely talk more about it but I think part of it is about thinking about modularity um, and also specific um, consenting to one thing doesn't mean consenting to other, to others right so just because you consent to like you know a one doesn't mean you consent to a two just because you consent to uh, using like the ephemeral chat doesn't mean that you have to follow every single thing in it that hasn't been described to you right so so those are basically those serve as like a very kind of like holistic ethos and guideline um throughout the design and production process um we also created something called a code of consent um which for us is a a, a document it's a specification in a document that details the level of consent and protection the users have while using the software. So that might sound kind of familiar because this is what a terms of agreement, terms of, uh, user terms agreement is supposed to do, right? Except um, the way we approach it is very much um, going beyond the kind of legal liability, you know, protection towards a company type of framework. So, so in terms, we are really trying to be user centric, um, focus on talking to the user in the language that's accessible, in a language that's welcoming, and also um, really think about things on the in the user's shoes. So, for example, one of the first thing we talk about in the code of consent is like, is that you know this software doesn't provide the kind of um, Encrypt, in, encryption and privacy level as like a software like Signal does, right? And so if you have, if you're working with really sensitive issues, if you're under targeted surveillance um, risk, then you should probably go use Signal. <laughs> so, so you know, there's like, you know, that that for us is like a kind of transparency of like not not sort of like persuading people to that our software is like the best, you know, thing that covers everything, but that it can cover certain things. But not others, right? So, so like helping people making informed choices is definitely a big part of it. Um, and so, in terms of color consent, like we very much like think about the source code, um, not just as like a technical series of files, but also containing like moral document. So, how do you like bind these two things together? Um, in a way that's going to um, sort of like keep like future developers who might remix the software accountable in certain ways, right? So, so we have this um, document that essentially address what each of the design, each of the main design in the software in the code is supposed to do, what's the intention behind it, what we're trying to do with it, and the, the level of con consent that it's offering, the level of privacy it's offering. And, and we try to explain that like the best way we can, you know, within a, you know, and also like within a limited work count. And so <clears throat> that's um that's currently in there and definitely invite you to take a read at it. Um if one if a future software, like the way we said it right now is that if a, so a future software developer decide that 
you know, I think one of, one of the biggest fear while creating the software is like, you know, it's an open source. Like what if someone just take it and like do whatever they want with it, but keeping the code of consent in there. And if, if a user use that without have, without knowing, without being able to match um, the, doc, the moral document with a technical document, then it becomes extremely deceptive. Um, so, so there are like guidelines on like how, how to sort of like um, approach and like kind of like appreciate and respect like the kind of like careful like cascading we have right now. And also what it means like when one breaks that. And, and essentially that just means that the person has to like take off the color consent document completely and disassociate from the name of the project. So, so it's, you know, there's like a lot of kind of figuring out on different ends um, when one begins to think about what it means to like practice consent um, in a software context. And I'm now going to hand the mic to Yaqing, who's going to tell us more about peer-to-peer -peer and WebRTC. Cool. Um, I think that you are controlling the slides, so I don't know what would be the easiest way to do this. Like, I can tell you to advance or like um, we can switch it or. Can you try moving your mouse? I just gave. Oh, you gave me oh control over your screen. Nice. OK, cool. Um, all right. I'm going to talk about how WebRTC works. Uh, basically, this is like a diagram of um, what is going on. I think like a core concept in the Internet or yeah, just like the web is you need to find where you're going or like who you're talking to or like where is the information that you're looking for. And that can be difficult talking peer to peer because like someone's browser is usually behind a firewall or like, you know, if you're at school, it's in a you, there's like a network, like a private network that you're on so that your computer itself isn't publicly findable by other people. So like usually if you go to a non WebRTC chat room, your messages are, or there's like other types of chat rooms, but I think like if you're using Facebook Messenger or something, um, you your message has to pass through um, the server that is like maintained by the person who built the chat room. Um, but what WebRTC allows you to do is um, just together and it like facilitates the finding of the person that you want to talk to. And once you've established connection, you're directly talking to your peer. Um, and how that happens is your browser would reach a Sun server, which is a publicly accessible server that tells you your own like information about who you are and where you are. You send it over a WebSocket connection through TogetherNet to everyone else who is connected to TogetherNet. And then um, TogetherNet basically like helps you establish the connection to your peer. And um, you know, once that happens, we build a chat room using um, the concept of a full mesh topology. The idea being every single computer that's connected to TogetherNet is connected to every other computer um, on TogetherNet. And um, in that way, every single uh, like browser that's connected has its own copy of the state of the chat room um, and no information. If you're in ephemeral mode, no information is stored on TogetherNet's server. Um, and we link to the actual code at the very end. So I encourage you to like take a look at the code and, and definitely like, yeah, reach out if anything is not clear. Um, and Yes, so basically it is a robust and decentralized and uh, not dependent on one particular node type of um, connection. So if one uh, you know, browser drops, you also have like a copy of the room um, on everyone else's uh, like machine. And also, um, yeah, uh, so, yeah. So this, this actually presented some like interesting problems to solve engineering wise, because um, basically people don't necessarily join at the same time um, in the conversation, right? So basically if I am talking to seeing and then someone else 
comes in, they need to see a copy of what has been going on to kind of actively participate in this like consent framework that we talked about. So there were a lot of like interesting things that we had to resolve um, in terms of being able to pass that information um, when someone logs on, uh, making sure everyone is synced. Um, and I'll also discuss some of the other like kind of interesting engineering uh, issues that we resolved working together. Um, so this is actually uh, what the project looked like when I joined. So it looks, oops, sorry, I'm trying to full screen, but I think I'm going forward. Yes, okay, so this is what the um, project looked like when I first joined um, and it looks uh, different than how it looks now. Um, but yeah, so one of the things we did keep in this um, version is like the idea of being able to move around while chatting with folks. Um, because when I joined onto the project, um, my favorite aspect of consent that we discussed was that um, it should be enthusiastic. And so we took that idea and um, I thought like the idea that you would move around while you chat is really fun um, and also requires constant participation from the users, which I think was really important. Um, we simplified the facilitation um, and chatting process a ton um, because uh, of the aspect of consent that um, it should be like informed and freely given. So I think the easier that a software is to use, the more transparent and the more like, you know, the more well-informed that the consent would be. Um, and if you notice here, um, so WebRTC was actually uh, first developed for like voice calls. Um, so if you notice here, we actually had an audio feature where we could send audio to people, but then because of the need to kind of sync rooms when people join, um, it became difficult because there was like a size limitation to how much data you could send over um, the WebRTC connection. Um, but to kind of supplement that, we put a bigger focus on the archival feature and making sure that it was like easy to use and robust. Um, so yeah, I think those were um, some of the highlights of, I think, my collaboration with seeing, and I'm going to hand it back over to them to talk about um, the culmination of our project and, and how we ended up using it with um, some workshops. All right. Can I give it back to you, or how do I stop remote control? I think I'm able to just kind of take it back. Oh, yeah. OK, cool. cool. Um, OK, so. So yeah, soft, oops, let's go back a little bit. Um, software and community. So a software doesn't mean very much without the community, right? We need people to use it. Uh, we need people to give feedback and for people to respond to it to like really kind of make this tool useful and also, um, you know, see how, how, the, how we, the way we envision the tool is actually going to really work IRL um, in applications, right? So, so when we were uh, forming the community around TogetherNet, which is like so much about thinking through consent, um, there were like two key decisions on like what we did on the public launch. So the first set of decision on the day of the public launch is I, you know, I had like for three other people, three other facilitators, um, they're Dorothy Santos, Kimberly Springer, uh, Shanae Macklin Holloway. Like they, they each facilitated a workshop um, using TogetherNet software. So one of the, the thing I was telling them is that please don't make this a demo. This is not a demo. <laughs> this is this is a workshop. This is a workshop where you're using TogetherNet to run. Um, but the workshop itself is not about TogetherNet. TogetherNet is a part of it. TogetherNet is like a software to, that facilitate the workshop. It's just as if, you know, if you go to a workshop and using like Discord or Slack as part of the tool to do something greater, right? So, or goal-oriented. So um, 
I, I really wanted it to be that way because um, I think what I was like the most curious about is how will people actually use this tool when they're actually collaborating with each other um, and not just sort of like getting a sense of like how the software works, but beyond that, how, how will the software be used and what are different ways for the software to be used? So that was like really interesting to me. Um, and also like very specifically, like this series of workshop, we're all relating to a different aspect of consent. So for example, the, the one Dorothy facilitated was called a study on biomedical and technological consent. It was very much about thinking about consent in the bio, biomedical field. Um, and in a way, I mean, this was one of the most popular workshop. People really responded to it. It's also COVID. So I think there's, um, there's a lot of kind of confusion and reflection and new sort of urgency relating to thinking about biomedical consent. And in this workshop, like we actually had a couple of health professionals uh, being there and participating and responded really, really well to TogetherNet. And this is definitely something that neither me or, or Yaching have perceived. We didn't, we've never put really any thought on like thinking about the biomedical field when we were designing the software. And was such a surprise to hear from health professionals. Um, like someone even asked, was this designed for biomedical? Because it really feels like what we're already, like that this is what we're already doing. We're, <laughs> you know, and this in a way makes it easier because it's, gen it's you know, automated by software. So, it was really fascinating to, to hear like a positive response from a group of people that we didn't necessarily think very much about before. Um, but I'm very excited about thinking about them, including their opinions going forward. And <clears throat> the second uh, workshop was on oral history. And again, like there's a lot of kind of bridges, bridges of consent in the field of oral history relating to one do a dominant group of scholars can like go into um, marginalized communities and kind of take knowledge and information and artifacts from them without their consent or like well-informed consent, um, so to speak. So, so oral history was another really interesting angle brought together by Kimberly. And we also had a workshop on sex and intimacy consent. So, so how do you facilitate and, and like what, what this workshop is, what's really interesting about this workshop was like this sex and intimacy consent workshop by Shane usually is facilitated in person and usually, usually involve bo like exercise that uses the body and uses, you know, like movement and space in different ways. So using this software, like also brought really interesting set of questions for her relating to you know, like what 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 is online asynchronousy good for in the context of like sex and intimacy negotiation? And I personally believe there's a lot of things that it's good for. There's a lot of things that it's not good for as well. But um, you know, like in terms, there's there's something about asynchronous communication that can be a lot more consentful. Like when you give people the time, when people have, feel like they have the freedom of time and ability to consider things before they respond, um, that tends to be more consentful. Um, what, what often gets lost is like subtle cues of emotions and, and things that are um, harder to sort of articulate with language, um, you know, such as tone of speech and the way people kind of express themselves in like all the nuances ways um, can kind of get lost for sure in an online context. So, so there's always like give and takes and trade-offs. Um, and the one I facilitated was on data placemaking, very much thinking about like, like how, how does, uh, like how can we like reimagine like public and private spaces on the internet and, and how like through, through like the thinking and like the lens of data privacy. Um, so, yeah, this was a workshop I did and it was really fun. Um, and in a way, like the software is already so spatial. So I think because the context and like the experience of the software already actually like provide a kind of separation between like the private, the ephemeral mode versus the public, um, the archive mode. Um, it, it, I think it was like a really good way to kind of like 
extend those ideas and see how people respond to the software itself and what kind of suggestions they had. Um, and this is our further reading list. Um, a list of readings, but not, you know, there, there, there were a lot more than this, but this, these were like the selected ones that really kind of um, inspired the making of the software and the research of the software. Um, I'll share this list with Dustin so that he can like put it in the description under the YouTube video um, so that it will be easier to click and find them. And finally, um, if you're interested in staying in touch and getting updates on the project, or if you want to check out the code and um, see if you, you know, can can like find anything that's interesting in there for you, feel free to visit our account. So on uh, Instagram, we're we're togethernet. On GitHub, it's togethernet dash support. And thank you all so much for being here. Um, we are available for a small Q&A if anyone have questions. Uh, yeah, that's great. Let's let's do some some questions now. Um, um, thank you for the talk. Um, I thought that the idea, the little uh, moving around boxes and leaving messages behind was very fun, like you said. And I never seen that before on a messaging app. Um, where how did you come up with that idea or was that inspired by something or was that just something that came about when you were designing it? Um, that's a really good question. So there are, there are some information that we haven't shared um, due to like the lack of time on um, the software, but I can maybe share it for a second right here, just a sec. Um, so the chat itself, the design of the interface itself definitely didn't start with like that interactive version. It started as very much like a vanilla text chat, you know, like very, very normal. <laughs> on the left hand side, this is ephemeral on the right hand side is archive separated by black and white, dark and light, you know, and and so it was very straightforward. This was like a quick sort of like throw together, like test uh, rapid prototype. And, and just to like see how it feels when, when we actually use it. So what, and, and there was like this idea of like this toggle. So there's like this eye icon and whenever you click on the eye icon, you get like all the kind of detailed information on what this protocol does or what this button does and you can turn it off, that sort of things. But I think what was, what became really daunting, especially after I started writing like these like technical description was that it's just too much. Like nobody's gonna read it. <laughs> you know, it's like, it was like way too overwhelming. Like a general, it's like you have, if, you, if you're reading like whatever is written here, I mean, this is just a small sample, but it's, it gets a lot longer, right? If you're already reading it, you are already in the club. <laughs> like you're already the kind of people who would like, go research what peer-to-peer -peer is on your own. So it kind of defeated the purpose. It, it, the, the entry point, the threshold was too high. So, so, what, so that basically led to a radical kind of reimagination of the interface, which is like, what if we can begin to think about user interface interaction design um, as a possible me medium to embody, to like represent, what the peer-to-peer -peer protocol is doing or the nature of those conversations. So using like um, moving avatars and text records that, you know, like stay or can disappear or can be, or can be deleted as like physical blocks that you kind of see uh, present versus disappear on the screen became a way that felt more representative of what um, the peer-to-peer -peer protocol was then a vanilla text chat, which, you know, like it's like, it's used so widely. It can be seen as a document. It can be seen as something that's persistent or, you know, it's like, it's hard to relate to the idea that this is temporary and ephemeral. So, so that was kind of the process, if that makes sense. Any plans to allow users to add little image avatars? Um, the project is also open source on GitHub, so please feel free to open up a PR 
like a fallen issue and contribute to it. That'd be pretty cool. Oh, maybe I will. Um, so uh, I have a question. The um, well, first, I think this idea of practicing consent and like you know in a software context is really interesting and sort of provocative. But I my my question is more about the workshops and the extent to which they sort of. Um, uh, you know, they, they changed your understanding of the sort of design uh, of TogetherNet or sort of or in, in maybe did they inform any sort of iterative changes or just or have they changed the way the sort of direction that you see things going in or, or not? I don't know. You know so. Um, I can talk about one experience we had with testing. Um, so like the current color scheme that you see um, actually was added pretty last minute. Um, and also the, I think that, yeah, even the text box that pops up on the side because we um, did a round of testing with some of these friends and um, one of the person, people there were, uh, was low vision and um, said that like the font size was too small and like the contrast was hard to read. Um, and also I think the avatars um, right now, the colors are generated randomly um, even though like at the very beginning, you can change the color later, but um, so sometimes like against that background, it's hard to see where a message is or where you are in space. Um, and we took that feedback pretty seriously and we changed like the entire visual um, like space, I think like one or two weeks before the final presentation. Um, and I think the next steps is also having like a bigger focus on accessibility. I think that's like, but yeah, that's that's really interesting. I guess the other way to reframe the question that I was trying to ask is, um, you know, do you see this catering to specific communities, right? Because like right now you're talking like it's this kind of general kind of tool that could be used for any number of groups. But like, did the workshops and the different topics that were being presented and the kinds of folks that showed up for those workshops, did, do you did it help you understand like who this might actually be kind of useful for? Yeah, um, well, the idea of the project is that this is a template. Like everything is made is boxy because it's supposed to be a template. So so the idea really is, you know, and we're still, honestly, we're starting to make, make a lot of tutorials for this and documentation. We just like haven't got there yet. And so we haven't been like super public about the project so far, but um, the goal is that people, um, communities would, like make a remix of the template. They can change any part of the language. Um, they can like, you know, turn the boxes into, I don't know, a circle or an image or avatar, whatever. <laughs> it's like, it's that you can customize any part of it in any way you want. And I think a lot of the time we put into thinking about what it means to build a template was like very much like imagining all these possible scenarios people can take, um, right, yeah, Ching, I think. Yeah, um, and I think another like another interesting question that came up, um, someone has asked us before, like, were we worried that something like this could be co-opted by like a group that, you know, um, wants to do something malicious on the internet? And I think like Sina and I discussed, and I think both of us are really strong believers that like technology should like facilitate a community, but it doesn't replace like the community building at the very beginning that would like allow people to come together. And um, in a lot of ways, like the software is built to kind of like work in a community that already exists and like has strong beliefs about maybe like what consent means or like care about consent. Yeah, I mean, there are things that I think some of the decision that I thought was like super interesting that, you know, me and Yaching, we had to like go through a lot of discussion, like a lot of like, kind of like uh, speculation to like figure out or to kind of come to a decision um, is, you know, like there's like such a fine line between like encouraging consent or consentful communication within a community versus enforcing it, right? So like right now, like you can see on the upper left of like uh, upper left of the software, there's like there's like a link to like read the community code of conduct. Um, 
you know, the decision of like, is it, is it mandatory? Do you have to upload a community code of conduct in order to um, activate the software? <laughs> or or is, it, um, is it just merely a link for people to question like, hey, do we have a community? Do we have a code of conduct? Do, is it, do we leave it to people to, to, like, to like trace the cues and question it? Or do we like kind of build it in so that certain things are mandatory? It's like, there's a lot of questions relating to that sort of things um, of like, how, how do you kind of like balance um, like wanting to foster consent, but also not making it overly top down or like beginning to become another form of surveillance. Right, to, um, to create uh, a framework for people to facilitate consensual communications, but not to necessarily force certain type, not to force it on them. It's, it's a really complicated question, you know, because I think one of the biggest, most, one of the biggest questions that people sort of like when they encounter the software that they ask is, you know, how do you prevent trolls? And I get, I get that question a lot, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, it's, I think, I think like the current way we know how to deal with trolls, um, you know, like learning from Twitter and learning from all these big social media platform is very much about blocking and kicking someone off um, or, you know, censoring certain kind of keywords that you don't, you don't want to see, right? So that's definitely one way of dealing with it. But I also think that um, I'm also very interested in like, how do you build a culture where like, it's hard to have a troll or tro a troll can, that, that doesn't feed trolls. How do you build a culture that doesn't feed trolls, you know? <laughs> and so, so like, I think, I think part of, part of it is about scale. Part of it is about encampment, encampment scale. So like a lot of like thought went into like, how many people should this software allow by default? And right now it's 12 people. So you can't have more than 12 people in here. And so we're like very, even though it's like a communication chat room E area, um, sort of like um, software, it's a communication software, but we're very much thinking about, you know, why is it that there's no trolls really on Google Doc? Like why, do, why does Google Doc or like collaborative document don't attract trolls? And what kind, what are the, how is, how is that a different kind of environment or culture or sense of visibility, you know? And how, how can we like adopt those, some of those existing ideas into this? Um, so one of it is about scale of the community and um, also like, you know, building in all these different elements to, to kind of um, make sure that, you know, it's not, like the visibility doesn't sustain or, you know, there, there are ways to do it without necessarily implementing like a kind of like administra administrative blocking kind of um, feature. So, so I think, I think that that's one of um, the thing that I thought was very interesting that we worked on. It, is it available online for us to use right now? Yeah, um, so there's an instance of it up on togethernet.horkyoff.com. Um, but yeah, so, oh, actually it's broken right now. Oh no, I haven't looked at it in a while, I'm sorry. It's um, not broken, sorry. I, <laughs> oh, okay. sorry. So like, um, I had to switch payment. Oh, okay. <laughs> I like payment info on Heroku. Yeah. Um, I can try to fix it. Yeah, we have a small one though right now because it's just like a demo, so I think. I thought that one was free, but um, we, yeah, so I think, um, like Steen said, there's like a people limit right now of 12. Um, the idea is like, it's like 12 per instance, um, but you're encouraged to kind of like down, like fork your own version, make, make your changes if you want, like contribute to the main one if you want, um, and then like launch your own instance and you can like share that with your friends and that could even be private, you know, and like, um, so um, yeah, you can also feel free to. Um, do, 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 you do you imagine developers being the ones that would launch their own instance, or are you imagining this something that you could set it up so that someone um, uh, that that just wants to have their own private communication space could launch their own version of it? Um, I think that would be the dream. Is like an easy way to launch an instance um, with like one click of a button or something. Um, but in the way that we wrote the code, we definitely wanted to make it 
like as easily like as easily um like understood as possible like um we i i tried using just like uh did i use jquery i think it's just like jquery and html um the server you don't really have to touch but like i think like we also wanted to make it really um just like friendly to someone who even has like a fundamental knowledge of code um to kind of make changes and um yeah that's a good idea i feel like i should add something to the readme that's like if you want to launch your own thing like here's how you can do it um, so that's mm -hmm. his question too yeah, really interesting question uh really interesting uh, topic you know project um looks like we have another question here uh yeah, I have two questions. Um, one for Ya Ching. Um, just out of curiosity, are you guys using the Pern stack for your code repository? Um, you're asking like Postgres. What? What? I forget what. Postgres, you're Express, React, and Node. Yeah. Express. Yeah. React and Node. Yes. Yeah. We are. Okay. Uh, cool. And then. I have a question for both of you. Um, I think it was partially some of this was discussed, but this project reminds me a lot of the right to be forgotten. So when you guys um, have the chat service open and people vote to have something archived, how will something be allowed to be deleted? Like when someone deletes something, will it delete on all of their instances or will it just be deleted on their? Um, I was just curious about that. Um, yeah, so there's two ways to delete. You can delete your ephemeral message, um, which will remove it from everybody's like browser forever and no one can see it ever again. Um, and you can also delete from the archives by, um, so you would have to be the facilitator in the archival room in that moment, um, just because we don't want like a thousand people doing things at once. So one person at a time can just delete a message that, um, was chosen consented to be archived um and actually wait so there's like a third way which is um if everybody like gives their consent to archive and if one person withdraws their permission um at any time after it's been consented to the message will also be deleted from the database um and you would have to vote again if you want to archive it again okay cool thank you Um, I was just wondering, like with the workshops, you mentioned that there was a voice chat feature, but I'm assuming that it was all through text chat that you guys did the workshops. And I thought that was interesting because I've only attended like um, like virtual video workshops. Um, so I was wondering how it was sort of facilitated and how people participated in it as well as like um, how it was ran and such. Yeah, um, so for the workshop, at least for like the alpha version um, that we released, like we we're still like using TogetherNet in combination with a like video conference app. So like like TogetherNet was very much contextualized as like a digital archiving, like no taking space, if that makes sense. I, I was curious, um, just really quick, what your like next steps were and um, like what were some challenges or things you would want to add? Um, maybe it was like technological limitations or whatnot. There's so many. <laughs> we have like a huge list of things and it's um, hard to, it's, it's a you know, it's challenging to prioritize. Um, some or you know it's 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 all about give and take. There are things that we can really do right now that will make everything make the basic like stability make, make the basic networking protocol way more stable and like the connection and all of that. But but we also have to think about accessibility, and like a lot of times when accessibility features are viewed as an afterthought. Um, it just takes more work. You have to retrofit the whole thing, and and it just um, becomes 
um, you know, it's, it's a waste of like the limited resource and money and people that we have. <laughs> so, so we are like really trying to figure out like how, how do we, how do we like cascade things in the right way, but also like make sure that we have like a basic software to test with. And this, these are the features we want before we also go into like the accessibility part, right? <laughs> so, so it's like all about kind of like a negotiation and balancing between different things. But the next thing for us is accessibility for um, the blind and low vision individuals. And we are beginning from um, making our website, rebuilding our website, uh, promote like the website that's public facing, um, not the actual instance to and make it fully or make it as accessible as we can for, for the blind low vision communities. and and in a way use that as a starting point to like um, find more support and also find more alignment um, within that communities. And also, I mean, one of the biggest project in a way the hardest part of all this is the hardware aspect, which like we haven't talked about very much. And it's in a way a whole other beast, <laughs> you know? Um, we're still relying on Heroku. We're still, you know, I would imagine that a lot of people who might use this would still, you know, rely on servers that is affiliated with AWS in some ways. And so how do we solve that problem? Um, I mean, that's, that's a really huge question. You know, how do, we, how do you make building servers way more accessible? Like, is someone doing that work already? Can we collaborate with someone? And like, that, that is definitely something that feels like step six for me, but it's very important um, because without that, we can't really fully talk about a consent in like a full stack situation, right? So, um, yeah, so that's, there's that. <laughs> um, but we, we've decided that accessibility was going to be the next. And then it's going to be after that, like making launching instance a lot easier. Um, for us, we're thinking about like, can we use something like Glitch, if you're familiar, and make it happen in a click of a button? Um, and you know, and Glitch also live on their own server. So, so we also have to look into what kind of servers they are and, and like, how do we like reframe the code of consent based on like, you know, any possible collaboration we make. Um, so, so it's all, yeah, it's all very kind of a, a big kind of daunting task. And I think one of the things that was kind of um, very humbling is like realizing that like a software is just never finished. <laughs> You know, like like software is forever. It's like it just it just it's not done. Or but it's like it's never done. I was like, and also like that was like moment of like, oh, none of the software I've used are truly done uh, in some ways, in some ways, right? And it's like it's okay to be in this stage and feeling like, oh my god, there's still so many things we need to do. And in my mind, without doing them, we're not there. Um, but kind of like also temper that feeling and know that this is going to be a long-term process and we should put things out and see how people feel about it and decide if we're going to get continuous support going forward. Really great. Awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, we should chat offline about the sort of accessibility stuff. I've been um, collaborating with some colleagues that... Uh, are sort of uh, steeped in sort of accessibility sort of issues. That, that would be really great. Um, one of the, you know, what the website access, the, like making a website accessible is a lot more feasible um, to make together net accessible is a really big research project because how, yeah, I mean, it's not that it hasn't been done before. It's not that it can't be done. It just um, takes a lot of innovations. There isn't a lot of existing framework on how you how you turn um, spatial information, and visual information into data that's going to be easily reusable. How do you represent, you know, the coordinate system um, without just kind of like reading it out, <laughs> which I, I would imagine be, being very frustrating and hard to remember in someone's head. Um, so, so like, how do we use sound, for example, was like one of the one other proposal we can use pitches, uh, frequency, and like mm. like left and right speakers that's building to most laptops to represent positions. So, but that's that in itself is a huge research project, you know, <laughs> and and we definitely need help on that because it's not our area of expertise. Well, uh, any other questions? Otherwise, I think we'll call it a day. 
All right. Well, thanks again. That was a really interesting project. Super awesome. Cool. Um, I can show you an email once we once I fix my. I think my credit card got disconnected <laughs> on Heroku, but I'll I'll let you know once it's um, up again. Yeah, we'll have to chat on TogetherNet. Right. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much.